Um, first of all, welcome to the first Southern Regional Science Association webinar. Um, of course, due to COVID and unforeseen events, we had to think differently and we're adapting with times and as everyone else is. So again, welcome. And we'd also like to thank the Northeast Regional Center for Rural Development who has provided the platform today for this uh, webinar. And we're fortunate to have two presentations. The first is um, Brandon Gen Genetin. He is the winner of the Barry M. Moriarty Graduate Paper Competition, and that's an award for outstanding original research. And in fact, it's, I believe it's the 24th winner of that award, started in 1997. Um, the second pr presenter is Tessa Conroy, and she is the winner of the uh, RRI's Regional Research Institute William Marinick Research Excellence Award. So the format today, we're gonna to have 20 minute presentation and discussion, five minutes. And after that, we'll hold questions to the end. And um, with that, let's begin with uh, Brandon Jenneton. All right, thank you so much. Hi everyone, so uh, like uh, Dayton said, my name is Brandon. Um, I go to Ohio State. I am a third year uh, PhD student under the tutelage of uh, Mark Partridge. Um, and today I'll be presenting um, research I've done in the last year uh, about uh, field of study mismatch and the impact on regional growth. So just some quick motivation for everyone is that um, anecdotally, um, regional and city politicians typically um, state that um, the region needs to increase their level of their educated workforce, but also match the needs of the region's industries. Particularly, um, policymakers consistently express uh, that local universities produce graduates with uh, degrees desired by regional and local businesses. However, are these concerns you know, necessarily warranted. Does it matter that they get the specific degrees or um, only similar degrees, or does that um, matter in general? From a supply and demand standpoint, we can say that local universities can either produce too many or too little of a degree. Um, so if that from a supply side, and then from the demand side, firms need specific skill sets and specific degrees, right? And oftentimes these two don't match perfectly. Um, some degrees that the firms actually need, uh, local universities under have under supplies of, while other ones that they don't need a lot of, local universities will have oversupply of those. So um, firms can either do two things. They can either one, state uh, take degrees or take individuals with degrees that are not their first choice for those jobs, or they can turn to migration and have individuals migrate in to um, the region to fill those needs or not. Um, and so the natural question that comes from this is, does the economic growth of a region suffer from this mismatch? So uh, my contribution is uh, specifically, I create an index to objectively measure this level of mismatch, this field of study mismatch. Um, and what I do is I just alter um, Duncan and Duncan's uh, index of dissimilarity. Uh, and this measures the level of mismatch between the degrees produced and the degrees demanded within a metropolitan area. So specifically, I'm asking, does the production of college degrees within an MSA match the occupational composition within the MSA? And do those mismatches negatively impact the economic growth of the region? Um, I, I would like to state that there is an importance of migration filling this void, right? So um, in this current paper, the draft, I have not yet um, been able to uh, measure migration yet. That's my actual next step. But um, migration might actually temper the effects of um, this mismatch and how it affects the uh, regional economy if individuals are just either moving in to fill those voids or moving out because they don't um, have the demand in that area. So 
uh, just a quick overview of previous literature. So the majority of research focuses on uh, vertical mismatch. So when I say vertical mismatch, I mean the idea that someone is either over or underqualified for a job. Um, that's where the large swath of research um, is located currently on mismatch. Although recently in the last decade or so, um, there has been more research on something called field of study mismatch or um, horizontal mismatch. The idea that I'm covering here, um, the mismatch between um, degree fields. Um, the research that is this, that the research that is a surrounding horizontal mismatch usually covers two things. It um, utilizes subjective measures of mismatch. So when I say subjective, I mean, they are utilizing surveys, asking the individuals themselves, how do you feel that you are mis, um, how do you feel your job is related to the degree you at obtain, attain? Um, or is it somewhat related or not related at all? So they use subjective measures. Um, the benefit of that is that the individual themselves can actually, you know, they probably have the best view of if they're matched or not. The downside to using subjective measures is that it's not um, constant or they're not using the same measurement throughout, right? So um, what I feel is mismatched is might not be um, the same as how someone else measures how they're mismatched in their fields. Um, and then uh, besides using subjective measures, they also focus on um, wage penalties. So the individual ramifications of um, the mismatch itself. So they were looking at how much um, do they, how much does their wage um, differ from the, someone who is actually mismatched. So what I'm doing instead is I utilize objective measures um, and then I focus more on the economic ramifications of the region. So this, just in case everyone, I make sure everyone understands the difference between vertical and horizontal mismatch. If you look at vertical and you would assume that each type of degree is stacked upon each other, then we're looking at the difference between education attained. So for instance, maybe you got a master's degree, but really what you wanted, uh, what the job required is an associate degree, that mismatch is a vertical mismatch. Well, then in horizontal mismatches, if you aligned all the degrees side by side, uh, maybe that you attained a degree in petroleum engineering, but really what you uh, only need, you needed is a chemical engineering. Um, and so that mismatch is created would be a horizontal mismatch. <laughs> Excuse me. So the first uh, step that I take in my identification strategy is I take the ACS, um, I think that's a typo, I, that's redundant, ACS survey. Uh, the, uh, I take the American Community Survey and create a distribution of each degree. So I believe it started in 2012, that the Ameri 2012 or 2010, the American Community Survey um, started asking uh, what, if you have a college degree, and if you do have a college degree, what uh, major did you get it in? And then if you combine that you can, uh, with what occupation they are in, you can create a distribution to what degrees go to what occupations. So for example, I could look at all of the finance majors in the ACS and create a distribution to what occupations they go to. So this, for instance, this is not the actual data. I just made this up for illustrative purposes. Um, for a finance major, you could say that 54% of them become financial analysts. 23% of them become budget analysts, 12% become accountants, 6% attorneys, and 5% miscellaneous. Um, then the next step I would do is I take each distribution for each major and multiply it by basically the amount of degrees that are being produced in each MSA in each year. This would uh, give me the supply of occupations or, uh, for each year, for each um, region in each year, excuse me. So, um, for example, uh, if we, I could say Syracuse, New York, uh, maybe the University of Syrac Syracuse University uh, produced 200 finance degrees in 2012, in, 2000, sorry, 2012, as well as maybe any other community colleges in that area. Uh, if they produce 200 finance degrees, then I could say that 
200 times 54, roughly 108%, 108 would become financial analysts, 23 times 200 would be budget analysts, 12 times 200 accounts, and six times uh, attorneys, and so on and so forth. And then, so now that I have my supply, I can just utilize uh, my, look at the demand side. And the demand side, I'll use a, I use a Bartik shift share instrument to get the demand for an occupation. So again, um, you know, I'm gonna pick on financial analysts and I'm gonna pick on the city of New York, a uh, city of Syracuse in New York. So if, uh, let's assume that there are 560 financial analysts in Syracuse, New York in 2012, and the national growth rate of financial analysts is 5% in 2012, then I say that the demand for financial analysts in 2012 in Syracuse, New York is 28 financial analysts. And then step four is that I aggregate up for each occupation to create field of study mismatch using um, the Duncan and Duncan index of dissimilarity. So, um, not only do finance majors become financial analysts, right? We're also looking at accountants are also becoming financial analysts. We are also looking at maybe business uh, administration or marketing. All of the majors that attribute to financial analysts, I take all of that combined up and that would be my supply and then I'm matching it to the demand. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, for those of you who are familiar, uh, who aren't uh, familiar with the Duncan and Duncan Index of Dissimilarity. It was created in, uh, by Duncan and Duncan, a pair of sociologists, um, in a publication in 1955 uh, that it measures specific, it was made to measure racial segregation in cities. So it would use neighborhoods and compare the proportion of African Americans to the proportion of Caucasians in each neighborhood and then aggregate up, get a level of racial segregation. Um, in this scenario, um, you can assume, if you are familiar with the Duncan and Duncan index of dissimilarity, you can assume that my uh, neighborhoods are just occupations and the proportion of African Americans and the proportion of Caucasians are just um, the proportion of occupation supplied and the proportions of occupation demanded. So um, as you see here, uh, the number is it between the range of zero and one. Uh, a index value, excuse me, of zero would imply that there is no mismatch. So everyone in this MSA is matched accordingly to their uh, the correct jobs. An index value of one would mean that there is um, everyone is completely mismatched. So we're looking at the idea here. Again, not to pick on Syracuse, but maybe if in year 2012, everyone became financial analysts. They, they only needed financial analysts, but everyone became nurses. That would be an absolute mismatch that would give you a number of one. Um, I then take that value and put, this, put it into a regression with fixed effects. So uh, my dependent variable here would be a measurement of economic growth. That's either two variables, that's um, log per capita GDP or log, uh, GD, uh, log per capita income, excuse me. Um, DKT is a measure of mismatch. I have two control variables, the percent of college educated in Metro K at time T and the percent of manufacturing jobs in Metro K at time T. So I base that off of um, research done by Glacier in 1989 when he was measuring economic growth. The uh, benefit is that, you know, I'm, ben I'm basing it off of Glacier. So, you know, he usually knows what he's doing. The downside is that's 30 years ago. So there's probably more control variables I can definitely use um, in this measure of economic growth. Um, and then I also include spatial fixed effects and time uh, fixed effects. Uh, data sources, manufacturing data came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, college education data from the ACS, data for per capita GDP and per capita income, both from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and the mismatch data from the American Con Community Survey, integrated post-secondary education data system, and the occupation of employment statistics. 
So just some summary statistics to look at, <coughs> excuse me, is that if you look at the mismatch value overall, the, there's a mean of 5.58. So that would say 58% on average 58% of individuals are mismatched in a city uh, with a standard deviation of about 0.1, uh, so roughly 10%, uh, with a minimum value of 0.28 and a maximum of 0.98. The 0.98 is probably from a year um, where there wasn't a lot of data for probably a smaller city. And so that would probably create an extreme uh, that, uh, number there. So some results in table in columns one through four, at, this is using the dependent variable of log per capita GDP. And in uh, columns five through eight, it's using a uh, log per capita income. Um, what's interesting to note is that mismatch values are statistically significant when there is no uh, fixed effects. And then those, and that's significant at the 1% level. Um, as when I include MSA fixed effects for both per capita GDP and per capita income, those numbers actually um, increase to be more negative. Uh, but then when I include time fixed effects <coughs> in either scenario, uh, that the number basically is insignificant and close to zero. Um, I, I mean, I, I have a couple of theories why that might be, but um, it's also interesting to note that when I include time fixed effects, that the amount of the college educated that becomes um, insignificant or when it is significant, it's very close to zero. So it makes me um, a little weary of using time fixed effects uh, just because uh, something that is commonly um, received as being very important to economic growth isn't being, uh, isn't significant in the, this analysis. So uh, what does this all mean? Well, a one standard deviation increase in the mismatch index, so roughly like 10%, would decre decrease this per capita GDP by 1.43% when there's no fixed effects and 1.7% uh, when MSA fixed effects are included. These numbers are similar when we're looking at uh, per capita uh, income, which is not surprising considering per capita GDP and per capita income should be very similar in size. Um, and then uh, the insignificance of results when including time fixed effects. So um, current issues and where I wanna go from here. Uh, so there's basically two big issues that I'm facing right now. <clears throat> One is finding a measure for migration. So I could utilize metro to metro migration flows by the Census Bureau. Uh, the benefit of that is that it tells me exactly how many people are migrating from one MSA to another MSA. The downside is I don't know who is migrating. So I, I would have to make further assumptions on what types of individuals with degrees and what degrees are um, migrating. I could possibly combine that maybe with national data of that would include what individuals are migrating um, with what degrees. Uh, but that's basically the next part I want to go to. Um, the other issue is that I have um, some spotty data issues. So I have 321 MSAs with 20 years of data, but I only have a, roughly 1,000 usable observations, when really that should be, if I, I was lucky, I would have 6,400 observations, right? Um, there's multiple problems with that. One is that, you know, I might have data on the supply, but I don't have data on demand for the same year. And so that if I don't have both, then I can't use that observation. And the other issue is that the iPads data seems to be very spotty. Um, so for instance, I, I looked at uh, Akron, Ohio, where I went to undergrad at the University of Akron, and they, uh, it doesn't report any degrees from the University of Akron from IPEDS, which is basically the main source for the MSA for Akron. Um, so trying to find a other reliable data source um, is important. Um, and that's something that's also on my um, radar with that. And then the other two uh, were things that I mentioned previously, so I don't want to um, restate that again. And in future work, I would love to work 
um, with mismatches according to industry. So maybe look at um, the finance industry or the tech industry and see how mismatch affects um, the growth and though it economic growth. And then also looking at mismatch according to the specificity of job requirements, right? So some jobs um, are very specific to degrees. So maybe an accountant, really, you need to have an accounting degree, but um, something like a business analyst, you can be um, have a multiple supply of degrees on that end. So looking at how the specificity of job requirements, how that affects, that those types of mismatches affect the industry. And then also finding areas that look at um, just finding more robustness checks, um, a other way to measure an aggregate level of um, mismatch is where I would like to go next. And uh, that is all I yield the rest of my time to uh, Brian. Thanks, Brandon. Um... Well, first of all, I, I enjoy this. I, my note to you, I, you know, I, I like the, the mismatch stuff and I, and I like the, the segregation index stuff has always been, been stuff I enjoyed. I, it's, uh, I'm glad you found something that, you know, it does have policy relevance, but it, it helps a lot to have something that that's really fun to work with. And I, I think you have some stuff that I've, I've always thought was really fun to work with. Um, one thing, just since I just jotted a couple of notes while I was talking, your um, your vertical and horizontal. I like that little graphic you just did in your presentation. That that would do well in your paper. To as one quick look at that makes it really clear what you're talking about. Um, you know, the the picture um, is worth a thousand words. Idea. That I think that's a nice one. Um, yeah, and I know some of the things we've you you clearly are aware of. Um, you know, migration obviously is a is a big deal here, and and I know you're still working on that. And it's not it's not easy, but obviously it's uh, it's it has a lot to do with the things you're looking at. Um, you know, and it's a little so you get down to the end and say, well, if it did this, then it you know probably it's migration, but it should sure be nice to to know answers. Um, you know, the ACS, I know there's some issues with that just because it's, it can be a little sparse and sometimes the accuracy is, is not great. And you, you know, I, although I think with metropolitan areas, probably at least the three, three year average data does something, but even for something quick on looking at some of the census stuff, they're you know, looking at their, they have their data on population um, estimates of components of population change. And you can, you know, it's net migration, but you can get very quickly get idea of net net international migration, net domestic migration. So you at least have some idea of, of flows into uh, net flows into areas um, separated by domestic and and international migration. So um, that that would be pretty quick, and I think is you know should be readily available for, for what you're doing. Um, you know there are obvious things like population growth and and things, but. But anyhow, I, that's important, and I think both immigrant, domestic, and international would be, be worthwhile. Um, a, a few other things, um, you know, and, and once again, I think things that you are aware of. On, I know one of your your example of University of Akron. Just you know, a lot of this policy about matching fields locally. You know, a lot of that has been really focused on community colleges or. Um, because there are universities in Morgantown, West Virginia University, you know, most people get their degrees there and leave the state. So it's, um, there's always kind of an oversupply of anything in Morgantown as a university produces more people, but we know a lot of that's going to, to change. But, um, but on the other side of that, it might be worthwhile trying to account for on it. There are, there are a lot of places that, that are, are certainly net importers of, of educated students versus Places like a Morgantown or maybe even a Syracuse that that become net exporters um, of students. Uh, a couple of the things I think on one of the things. So with your data, um, and this gets into the time fixed effects, which kind of wiped out everything. Yeah. Also, is that your data? I you know 
almost smack in the middle of yours is the Great Recession. Right. Which right. You know, completely changes so many things, including, you know, really slowed down migration and places that were growing rapidly. Right. Um, you know, to use technical language, got their butts kicked. Um, a place like Las Vegas that was roaring, you know, had the highest rates of, of home foreclosures. And so their housing market collapsed completely for a few years. And so that, might, that, that recession in the middle of yours changed all kinds of things. But, but in general, some of that might be being picked up by the time fixed effects that kind of, yeah, you have all this stuff. But in the end, this, this recession had such dramatic changes on labor markets that, that might be overwhelming a lot of stuff. Um, so it's something worth kind of giving, giving a thought about how that, that might fit in. Um, and in general, business cycle stuff can affect labor markets. And you might even think with the field mismatch, you, you'd probably expect that you know, maybe there's more mismatch late in the business cycle when the labor market gets tight and it's kind of, you got to accept whoever you can get. Right. But, uh, you know, when just coming out of a recession, there are all kinds of well-qualified people looking for positions. And so it's a buyer's market. Right. Uh, different points of the business cycle. And that may vary. You know, I know the Great Recession didn't hit all places equally or at the same time. So you might start to think about how, how those things play out. Because I think uh, parts of the business cycle or you know, labor market conditions at any given time might affect whether businesses can be choosy or, or not be choosy. Um, another that, that you, you talk some about, I, I think it is worth, I really like what you're doing with the occupational data and trying to match up what are the fits, what do you declare, what do you call a mismatch? And um, I think more work into that is good. And you know, I think of things, you know, when I was in college, I started to be a math major and, you know, not understanding well enough, kind of, <laughs> what am I ever gonna do with a math degree? Um, right. Well, it turns out there are lots of things. And if you looked, you see math majors, when you see what places they go to, you know, actuarials, financial analysts, business analysts, operations research. You know, there are some degrees that, you know, if you can get more deeply into kind of, yeah, we have my major things that, but yeah, here's this math degree that, you know, a lot of people in this field are drawing them and it's a, you know, it's a long step down to what comes next. So you might you know, I think it would be worth looking. It sounded like you're planning to, that you're working more on that. That right. Yes. Yeah, there are some substitutes that that are people that you know. Yeah, it's not perfect, but they have the skill set we want. Um, right. And the skill set in some areas, in some occupations, the skill set may be more important than than what they learned in school. Um, and so I think you know. So lots of lots of that sort of interesting things. Um, Another was is size of places. Um, you have such a wide range of metro areas, and agglomeration economies certainly come into some of this. That you know it might be the big metro areas they have all these different people, um, and it might help their growth. And, and they may have enough to choose from that they can match what they want because it's a dynamic labor market. You know, but they're also benefiting from the agglomeration economies. Um, right. And so is it, is it uh, you know, is it just the labor market stuff that they're matching well, or, or, is, or is that stuff picking up some effects of agglomeration economies that we're not separating out? Um, and some of the places you have, if you go over your time period, you know, there's some of these places like some of the Texas metro areas that, you know, they may have increased 60% or more in size during the time of your study. Absolutely. Their agglomerate, their level of agglomeration economies and how their labor market works might be very different at the end of your period than at the beginning. Um, um, what else do I have? Uh, yeah, you need more control variables and you, you understood that. Um, you know, so I know it's difficult with fixed effects. You know, you'd think, well, you know, things like race and, and age, but fixed effects are probably gonna wipe out some of those, although not all of them. Um, years of experience variable, I forget what's in ACS. But, you know, lots of job, well, you know, they might say this degree or three years experience. Right. And from all smaller metro areas that, you know, three years experience, it's, you know, very quickly, um, they may not need people in these, in this, with this particular major anymore because I have this person that, you know, it, it might just be kind of a standard part of. Yes, absolutely. Labor market 
markets work, that the years of experience ends up becoming a dominant um, factor in those mar smaller markets. Um, uh, one variable you might think of as a control, and you'd had manufacturing in there, but I don't think that's quite enough. Uh, you know, you might look more into uh, occupational mix of of metro areas. You know, uh, uh, Midland Odessa is you know that's in the heart of the oil patch. And if you look at their occupational mix and their location quotients, it's you know yeah. traction, it's heavy, you know, trucking and 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 tractor and all these services. Uh, are so dominant there. Morgantown metro area, we have the university, we have a major health center, and we have Milan Pharmaceuticals. And that's, right. you know, and that's of our, and so especially for smaller areas, this occupational mix, because if this mismatches, you start to talk about, it might be more important for some, some types of industries or occupations. Right. Areas. And so this may vary a lot for different places that the occupational mix of some places it just might not matter that much and for other places it might be critical and so that so you might see very different things in terms of how that mismatch affects growth in these areas with different different occupational mix um, and manufacturing might get at some of that but i think it there's much more than just manufacturing um and i don't you know probably i have other things i could send some other things to you but i'd rather kind of open it up to let other people other people throw in their their insights. Um, Absolutely, thank you. Let me stop there, and I can we can communicate more outside this. But let me stop there. So if there are others who have some insights or some thoughts, they can have time to do that. Yeah, Brandon, I see three questions from the panelists or from the attendees. Okay, can you see those uh, under chat? Yeah. Uh, one of the questions is about fixed effects on slide 10. Okay. What's their interpretation and how, how can you explain them? So, um, I mean, when I'm utilizing fixed effects, I'm for uh, uh, basically MSA fixed effects, you know, I'm only looking at the variation within the metropolitan areas. And then I'm just taking, I mean, the, I look at the variation and get the average of the changes within the metro areas. Um, I, sorry, I, I guess I'm a little confused with the question about what to actually explain. Okay. Um, then there's another question. I'll just read it. I was wondering how you think about the degree choice by students. You might choose a degree that helps you find a job locally or help you get out of a place. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think that would go to a, a larger discussion of do you choose degrees that are basically, you know, a passion of yours and you know that it's not going to be hard. It's going to, you know, that it's going to be hard to get a job or do you choose a degree that you know you're choosing this degree because you're likely to find a job. It's in demand. It's high. Uh, so I, I haven't thought of that um, more in depth, but I think it's an interesting conversation to have. I don't know if there's any studies or data out there that tries to look at the difference between um, how many individuals choose a degree just because they can get a job or get out of an area compared to someone who um, compared to someone who does it just to follow you know their dreams uh, because it's a passion of theirs okay well in the interest of time um, there's a few more questions maybe we can have those questions answered I believe the chats are safe so we could follow up that way um, yeah. let's if we can, let's move on to our next speaker today, Tessa Conroy. And Tessa is the winner of the Mirnick Medal, and that's awarded annually to an eligible author, the best paper presented at annual meeting. And um, the, discuss the title of the paper is The Need for Speed, Rural Broadband and Entrepreneurship by Business, Size, and Gender. 
and Anil Rapasinga is going to discuss Tessa's work. So Tessa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing us together today. Um, I'm so glad to get to share this work. I didn't realize a year or two ago when Sarah and I started working on this, how much I would come to care about broadband, particularly in the last six weeks or so. Um, I read this morning that 43% of rural households in Wisconsin don't have high-speed internet, so um, it's just become all the more pressing. So glad to share and get a chance to improve the work this morning. Um, my, out of enthusiasm, I think my presentation's a little long, so I'll take some opportunities to be uh, concise and hit the highlights, but um, first I want to point out that this is work with Sarah Lowe at the University of Missouri, and it's called The Need for Speed, Rural Broadband and Entrepreneurship by Business Size and Gender. So, excuse me, first what motivated us to do this work is the observation that rural areas have been struggling since the Great Recession, lagging behind urban areas. And, and one example of that is the way rural areas have struggled to reach pre-recession employment. Um, some rural areas sort of just recently were getting back to those levels. And the lack of broadband only amplifies those challenges for rural areas, including the business owners there who might really uh, benefit from what broadband can do for their business. So in light of these challenges, the way it's affecting rural areas, uh, expanding broadband has become a top USDA priority. I think you're seeing that in the expanded spending and, and most recently some of the initiatives in the CARES Act focus on broadband. So what we wanted to do is contribute to that policy conversation by focusing on all of rural America, looking at how broadband affects startups, and then drilling down within startups to think about are there differential impacts by business size or by gender. So the broadband literature, I'll sort of summarize with two points. The first is that the gaps persist. Um, there have been a number of policy initiatives and there have been pockets of really fast growth in broadband, but there are still gaps in rural adoption. So rural areas still behind uh, generally the um, urban areas, even in, like I said, recent years, as recent as today. So, the second point I would say is that rural broadband has been linked to strong rural economies uh, and strong rural businesses, and that's been done through a number of different papers. There's some really great work out there. I would say that the limitation or gap in the literature is that what has been done tends to focus, for example, on a particular state or a particular sector, such as agriculture, or um, uses a static measure of entrepreneurship. So rather than looking at something dynamic like startup activity, we're looking at the count or, or level of businesses in an area. So we saw an opportunity to contribute in this pocket by looking at rural together uh, and uh, a variety, all, all sectors, et cetera. So a more comprehensive look perhaps. We also wanted to have an eye on women-led businesses, and that's because there's evidence that women-owned businesses are different in important ways. So women-owned businesses, for example, tend to be smaller, more likely to be home-based, uh, sometimes a part of a strategy to juggle childcare and earning an income. So taken together, we thought these differences sort of point to women-owned businesses perhaps being especially sensitive to broadband, uh, having broadband available in their homes so they can run their business that way. And that women entrepreneurs, we're also learning, are pretty important for regional economies. Uh, two points that I'll highlight are the stability effects. So some work with Steve and I were able to show that the regions that had more women business owners had uh, less of a downturn during the last recession. So there seems to be the stability effect. Uh, and then the US Department of Commerce highlighted the job creation in the decade leading up to the recession as well. That, that was a period of robust job creation for women-led businesses. So we wanted to have an eye on those as well. In the paper, we have a model to motivate these hypotheses, and we use the model. Um, it is a model of entry based on profitability. I would just use that model to kind of organize our thoughts and demonstrate the way we think of broadband impacting businesses. So we see it both on the sales side, that broadband can help businesses increase sales, reach new markets, and that can be really important, but also find uh, the most competitive source for any inputs that they have. So we see it also lowering costs for businesses. So in general, we see broadband enhancing profitability, which should incent entry for a given business. Taken together across latent entrepreneurs in a region, we would expect this to enhance entry or the birth rate. 
So that leads to our hypotheses um, that broadband would have a positive effect on the establishment birth rate. And then when we were thinking about this kind of marginal change of profitability from broadband or how this kind of incremental change that might affect businesses, it seems like it might be especially important for the smallest businesses or those that have very thin profit margins. So we also hypothesize that this is going to have a positive effect on women-led establishments and non-employers um, separately from employers so that we can test that separately and see those effects and that they would be relatively large in the non-employer or women-led category. So in turning to a regional framework and framework and thinking about regional growth, what we have here is the birth rate as a function of broadband, as well as a number of regional controls that have been shown to um, impact the regional economy and we want to control for so that we can look at the effect of broadband. So we're going to use education, um, a bardic demand shop to make sure that the change in entrepreneurship is sort of apart from any national growth trends, population, we'll control for small business lending behavior, income and employment growth, housing values. We're going to include a couple of variables uh, that we think are particularly important for women entrepreneurs based on the literature, so such as the share of married adults in a community and the number of young children, so children under five um, per woman social capital, the share of foreign born, natural amenities, and then distance to the nearest MSA of um, 100,000 or more. And we're going to, again, look at this just for rural counties. So have, uh, I think, 1,900 observations. Uh, so we're going to estimate this model using the total establishment birth rate and then look at some subsets. So we'll look at separately the subset for employer establishments and non-employer establishments, and then do it all again for the female-led establishments. As far as data, the thing here that I want to spend the most time on is the advantages of the NETS time series or National Establishment Time Series. So uh, with this data, thanks to um, the partnership with ERS, we were able to calculate a three-year average of the establishment birth rate. So we're going to look at 2005 to 2007, so we get the peak of the business cycle. And we're able to get the total establishment birth rate, the female owned, uh, I guess I should more generously say the female led establishment birth rate, employer and non employer establishments. We view this as an important feature of the paper. Uh, non employer startup activity is pretty hard to track, at least in my experience. I haven't been able to find another source where we can look at these non employer businesses, so before they're paying payroll taxes, and identify when they start. So this is I think a unique look at non-employer startup activity uh, and then particularly in rural areas. The, net, the NETS data also has um, indicator variables for women owned or a female CEO and we combine those to say that these are our are women owned or women led establishments. And then we're going to calculate the birth rate with uh, population in 2007. Uh, I think the, the rest of the variables um, I won't spend too much time on, but we do want to highlight that we're going to use um, the FCC Form 477 to get our broadband access data. So we're looking at a county level average of the number of providers per zip code in 2003 um, in relationship to our establishment birth rate. One thing that I think might be important to mention here is that we're sort of operating under the assumption that more providers mean more geographic area covered versus more competition. And we think that based on the way the data is reported in that in a rural or the way ISPs report broadband, even if one household in a, in a region, in a, in a zip in this case, uh, has service, then the provider can say they're providing service in the whole area, even though if the majority of households do not have coverage. So if we have two providers claiming coverage, we hope that that amounts actually to more households getting coverage than it is to two providers competing over the same area. So this is a lot of um, data by my summary statistics here. Uh, so what I want to draw attention to are the establishment birth rates at the top. So first we're looking at the establishment births uh, for firms of all sizes. So this is the birth rate from, again, average birth rate from 2005 to 2007, about nine births um, per 1,000 people. 
And I'll point out that there's actually more non-employer births than employer establishment births. And I would say that's consistent uh, with how it looks when we compare the non-employer statistics from the census with the county business patterns from the census. Non-employers are actually 70, 75% of businesses in the US. So I think this makes some sense, particularly uh, just because of the way we've defined non-employers as those businesses with just having one employee. So an entrepreneur, him or herself, um, and sort of err on the side of being conservative when we might have included partnerships. And then the second thing that I'll highlight is just that the female-led establishment birth, uh, birth rate is much lower, of course, so just 2.18 births per uh, 1,000 residents, and that we see the similar pattern that the non-employers really make up uh, a majority of the activity. And then um, the very top control variables are broadband access. So uh, one, one and a half providers on average per zip code. Um, and then the rest of these I might talk about as we get to the, some of the results, but I can happy to maybe answer some questions at the end. So here's a map. This is a map just looking at rural counties. So the, the urban counties are uh, the ones in white. So we're not considering those here for this paper. Uh, and you can see the variation of broadband providers. So it's just striking to me that we see these broad swaths of light green, meaning that a lot of the country just in this very kind of low access to broadband country, especially in the central plains, um, that seems like a particularly big region to me, parts of the south and southwest. Uh, as well as through Appalachia, so big parts of the country uh, still, again, facing that lack of broadband. And then here we have the establishment birth rate, this, uh, and, and same here, we're just looking at the, the non-metro areas. Uh, what's interesting to me is that when I think of entrepreneurship, some of these areas that are showing up in blue aren't necessarily the areas that I might think of as being the most entrepreneurial. And I suspect part of that has to do with the way we're including non-employers, that oftentimes when we're looking at startup activity, we're looking at this employment-based definition of startup activity where, you know, it's based on hiring your first employee. And when you look through the Central Plains or parts of the South and you're seeing these really high or, you know, higher than average uh, establishment birth rates, I suspect it has to do with including non-employers uh, and suggest that we get a different regional picture when we include them in analysis. So endogeneity, um, this is another place where we're hoping we can um, make a contribution and move the dial a little bit in terms of establishing causality. So there's an unclear relationship between entrepreneurship and broadband access. I, I, the way I think about it is, you know, is it the case that broadband leads to more entrepreneurs or is it the case that a lot of startup activity and business density and the demand from those businesses results in those communities getting broadband? So with that in mind, we wanted to use an IV strategy. I'll just talk about the first two instruments there, the land developability index and the topography z-score. The average commuting time to work we end up just using in some robustness checks in the appendix. Uh, but I think the, the most interesting instrument is the land developability index. So that was developed by a geographer here at the University of Wisconsin. And what they do is look at six layers of land developability. So that includes, or excuse me, of land use. That includes water, wetland, uh, federal and state-owned properties, American Indian reservations, built up land, and slope. And we can imagine all of these are going to add to the cost of building broadband infrastructure. And so we expect an inverse relationship to uh, broadband access, but these features of the land and the kind of historical or geological context should make them sufficiently exogenous that they don't have a relationship to um, entrepreneurship. So we, we think we have a nice instrument here. Um, similarly, we're going to use a topography z-score. Uh, that worked out as a nice partner with the land develop developability index and operates kind of under the same tuition in that we're looking at um, an, uh, excuse me, characteristic of the land that is primarily determined by elevation and using that to understand broadband uh, provision. And I'm thinking here that there's this inverse relationship. So looking at our results. So I won't spend too much time on these very dense uh, tables or slides with the tables, but um, I'll just highlight a couple of things. So 
we have almost 2,000 observations. So again, looking at all of the rural counties in the contiguous United States. And then uh, first looking at the results for the establishment birth rate of all sizes, then for employer establishments. So those are gonna be more with uh, startups that start with two or more employees. And then last looking at the non-employer startups. And what you see as a, what I think is a pretty nice consistent result in terms of a positive and consistently um, significant result on broadband access. There are a couple other things I might come back to, you know, small business lending also important in these communities. Um, but with regards to our focal results down at the bottom, I will, I'll point out that with looking at our first stage F, our instruments perform, I think, pretty well. Uh, and then with the endogeneity test, we do find that we have endogeneity. So I'm only going to present here um, the IV results. And, and if you're interested in OLS and those, um, they'll be in the appendix of the paper. And then also here, including our regional fixed effects. So those are census regions um, controlling for kind of the, the variation within places um, so that we can get a clearer picture of how broadband's affecting startup activity. But to help us understand these more clearly, I want to point out um, or think about a one standard deviation increase in broadband access in an otherwise average county. So how do these counties with a little bit more broadband compare uh, to those with just typical access? First, looking at employer establishments, we see that by uh, a county with a one standard deviation higher um, measure of access to broadband would have an additional 0.72 employer establishments per 1,000. Uh, in a typical rural county with about 25,000 people in our sample, that translates to about 18 additional employer establishment births. Looking at, again, uh, non-employer establishments, so keeping in mind that these make up about 75% of businesses in the U.S. to see much larger effect. So an increase of a one standard deviation, or excuse me, a county with a uh, access to broadband that is one standard deviation higher than average, we would expect um, 2.49 additional non-employer establishment births per 1,000. And then looking at kind of looking at these together in terms of how does this affect the establishment birth rate of any size, we would expect an additional 3.21 total births. Um, I don't have them here and I was trying to think back to the paper. Uh, in terms of, you know, how do these, these increases compare to the mean birth rates? Uh, I think if I remember right, we're looking at increases in the range of, you know, 15%, 30% and then upwards of even 50%. So I would consider those substantial increases in the birth rate. And then looking at female-led establishments, so same pattern here, first looking at all sizes and then employer establishments, those with two or more employees at the start, and then non-employers. And again, seeing a consistent positive result. Um, instruments perform relatively well uh, and then generally have endogeneity. The one place where we perhaps don't have endogeneity, according to the statistical test, would be in women-led employer establishments. Um, there's a number of things going on here, good things going through my mind when I look at that. Uh, there just aren't that many women-led employer establishments. The large majority, uh, I want to say upwards of 80 to 90% of women-led establishments are not employers. And then when you get into rural, it gets even thinner. So I think we're sort of um, getting into some challenges with the data here. Um, if you want to be on the con maybe conservative side and look at the OLS results, they're fairly consistent, um, just a slightly smaller coefficient, but I'll try to focus the discussion on the establishments of all sizes and non-employers. So with those in mind, um, a one standard deviation or a county with a one standard deviation higher uh, access to broadband uh, in terms of total business activity, we would expect uh, one firm more per 1,000 residents or an establishment birth rate or one firm higher. Uh, if we look at non-employers, we see that that dominates kind of the story being told here. Um, so we would expect 0.88 more female-led non-employer births per 1,000. And then uh, a small effect, I have it sort of grayed out here just because we didn't um, find that evidence of endogeneity. Uh, but again, it, it was the results are consistent across our OLS estimation in terms of um, direction and significance. The, the last 
piece that I want to offer is we wondered about how this would look in the most remote and rural counties. So we looked at the rural urban continuum codes and isolated uh, 579, so the non-metro, non-adjacent counties, and put in an interaction here. And the results are interesting. I mean, we find this boost in terms of, yes, broadband access enhances um, startup activity, and all the more so in remote rural counties when we look at establishment birth rates of all sizes. Um, and then when we look at women, it appears that the, the results that maybe we were just looking at are perhaps even driven by the remote rural and that that's where we get the, the positive effect. Um, I see that my results copied in wrong with a, a negative sign, but I'm sorry about that, forget that. So we still do have this remote rural story as well. This seems to be um, important for remote rural counties as well. So just to summarize, um, broadband internet has the potential to equitably enhance entrepreneurship in rural America. Um, so many programs I think out there are focused on high growth entrepreneurship, for example, um, or serve particular sectors or particular aspects or groups of entrepreneurs. Uh, broadband is a way to, it, it would appear to help most entrepreneurs, which is something um, that I think policymakers might appreciate. Um, our results are robust to firm size, including those previously hard to track non-employers, robust to gender of the owner, and we provide some evidence that these are stronger in remote rural areas. Uh, we hope that our treatment of endogeneity and the way we've used IVs is valuable to folks who are working on this. Um, our instruments seem to work well in this case. And then when we talk about moving forward, I certainly think there are a lot of questions to still under, understand. Access is just one component of internet in rural areas. More and more I'm hearing about the struggle with adoption, um, the problems of adequate speed, as well as the problems of affordability. So thinking about all of these other aspects of broadband as we think about uh, rural entrepreneurs as well. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you for your time. It was great to get to share this today uh, and look forward to your feedback so we can improve this work. Thank you. So um, this is Anil Rupa Singha. I am the discussant for the paper. Can you hear me all? Yes. Okay, good. Um, by the way, congratulations, Tessa, on winning the Research Excellence Medal on this paper. Uh, um, actually, I read the paper for the second time. I read an earlier version. Um, it, it was uh, good to see that it has, uh, you know, turned out to be a good paper. Um, uh, in terms of the contribution, I can see that, you know, paper uh, is a very clear and uniquely identifying uh, and also comparing to the literature. Um, the idea to look at the you know, the non-employers and also the women on businesses, I think kind of uniquely separate this paper from other papers. Um, you also um, done a really good job uh, of uh, doing the literature search. Um, I myself have gotten into this research for the past six months also in my new job and have been reading a lot of papers on uh, broadband and the impact of broadband on business outcomes and the other economic outcomes sort of things. Um, I think the paper discussed the results thoroughly comparing to the other literature and so on. I uh, basically have two uh, major kind of comments, but um, I understand that it might be kind of too late to uh, address this, but I'm going to mention this anyway. Um, um, why uh, the 2005 to 2007 time period? Um, I know that you wanted to focus on a time period before the Great Recession, and uh, but I, I was wondering, you you have uh, NETS data and even the broadband data for later time periods. Um, I, I was wondering whether um, you know. Uh, you might want to maybe at least as a robustness checks uh, pick another time period from later years. Um, even uh, you know, uh, since this is a cross section analysis, I was also wondering like you know, you have data for multiple years that gives you the possibility even for a 
you know, panel type of analysis, not just the business data, but you also have probably broadband data. Um, so that was my first kind of major command. But the second one is on the broadband measure that you are using. Um, I know I, I read this paper before, so but since I have gotten into more literature after that, I, I you know, I think um, uh, there are other measures like, as you, you are kind of envisioning in your future, future research, but uh, you can also do this in this paper as well. Um, I know that the number of providers in a county has been used uh, a lot of time in the previous papers. Um, and it, it, it is, it might be a proxy for the level of competition and probably prices and things. But, um, you know, with this measure also, sometimes, especially for rural counties, you know, less providers does not always mean less access. Uh, you know, there can be one provider uh, in a county uh, providing the services to whole county. So, uh, uh, so, so you have that issue with the, current measure. Uh, another issue that I mean I was kind of reading the literature came across was like um, you are using the year 2003 for on um, the broadband um, availability. Uh, it looks like the initially uh, the list of uh, the zip code service that was collected by FCC twice a year basically for high speed providers with at least um, 250 lines in a particular state. But, um, you know, this, uh, some rural and remote areas were being depicted as unserved in this data. They still had, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure available to them, uh, the broadband infrastructure. There were providers simply not large enough, like 250 subscribers, to meet the necessary filing. So uh, FCC actually kind of uh, in June uh, 2005 corrected this and they started uh, collecting um, or at least the form 477 required all providers of high speed connections to report. Um, I read some actually as a result of this change. Uh, by the end of 2005, broadband providers uh, kind of jumped like uh, twice the number that was uh, before June 2005. Um, why not use broadband adoption and uh, you know, access together? Of course, uh, you need to um, pick a later time period in order to do this. You, uh, I think the paper will be stronger footing if you did that. Um, if you had used a more recent time period, you could have used like uh, you know, county level uh, broadband adoption rates. Um, available, I think, uh, from 2008, and a national broadband map data available from 2010, both at the county and the census block level. I think uh, the adoption rate is available at census track and the county level. I know that a more recent paper, especially uh, by Brian Whitaker, used adoption rate, or oh, sometimes he used both adoption and availability together. Uh, since 2008, FCC collects uh, both number of providers and adoption rates, um, basically residential um, broadband adoption rate. Each county is assigned a value between one to five based on percentage of uh, households with adoption. The other one, the national broadband map, um, you know, average values for maximum advertised download and up upload speeds and unique number rights at the county level and also the block level. I know that the census block is in, in the broadband map. Uh, the census block is considered served if one uh, customer in that area has access to broadband. That is a, a problem with uh, broadband. Those were kind of my two um, uh, major commands. And um, uh, something minor, maybe, uh, I know that you were not, you, you, um, you know, uh, focus is the access to broadband here in the paper, but uh, there are other control variables. I noticed that your population density um, variable and also um, I think the distance to nearest metro. Um, um, 
both have a kind of, I think, unexpected sign. Um, I don't know whether you check for this. Uh, perhaps maybe it is a multicollinearity issue, mm. or, or maybe you should, you know, uh, try. Uh, usually, when um, what I have seen is like when distance uh, is included, distance squared is kind of automatically included. So that might even take care of that uh, issue also. Um, you know, you and I have both used NETS data before, but. Uh, uh, it's usually, you know, uh, when papers are submitted and comes back to the review, they always, you know, ask you to identify the so-called shortcomings in the next data. You might want to, you know, include some uh, some of that in the paper, like, you know, um, earlier, um, I think very early, um, uh, some papers criticize um, uh, business data based on Dun and Bradstreet and uh, DMF. DMI files. Um, I know the Newmark, the David Newmark, um, does a thorough vetting and rebut some of these, um, you know, uh, claims. Uh, more recently, uh, there were at least two papers uh, by Federal Research Board looking uh, uh, at, at the next data and find fault with some aspects of the data. Um, they find discrepancies between NETS and official sources. Of course, uh, that is mainly due to uh, the fact that the NETS data include uh, non-employers and uh, you know the government, uh, other government sources don't, uh, and they also find issues with industry labeling. They are less um, the NETS is less useful for studying business dynamics and things like that. So um, that's all I had to say. I'll leave there. I'll allow the others who may have questions to post their questions. Should I respond to Anil at all, or would you like me to uh, see the other questions? Yeah, go ahead and respond. Okay, great. Well, first, thanks so much, Anil. Um, your input on this paper has been really helpful. Um, and again, today, uh, in response to some of your questions, I think I can, we thought a little bit at least about some of these, so I'll share that. Um, why 2005 to 2007? It, it, it's a little bit of a, a sweet spot in our minds. Uh, there, at the time we were grabbing the data for this paper, I think that was available through 2014. And my understanding of NETS is that it's uh, backward revised. So the most recent years of data um, maybe are a little less um, reliable, haven't been um, combed through once again. And then going back to the very early years in NETS, those were also a little problematic in my experience with the data. So uh, it seemed to be most reliable right in the, the middle and then wanting to get that business cycle. I certainly see value in, in moving the paper forward to in terms of a time period of study. So I hope we can come back to that now that there are more years of data available. Um, and then though we arrive at the challenge of um, creating a panel of broadband data. And, and this comes from a, from a conversation with, with Liz at Michigan, Liz Mack, um, and, and just trying to learn better about how this data is collected. And my understanding is that there are just a lot of challenges with creating a good panel of data. Uh, it doesn't mean it certainly can't be done and we shouldn't try to do it. Um, it was just some of these challenges that led us to choose the period that we did. Um, and yes, you know, I think moving on to, you know, as you said, adoption and then more thoroughly discussing, as you said, the shortcomings of the data, uh, who's, who's included, who's asked in terms of that uh, form 477, um, the caveats of NETS, I think that that needs to be more thoroughly addressed as well. As far as distance to MSA, you brought up, you know, maybe wasn't as expected. Um, and maybe this is just, you know, exposing my bias as a researcher in that I think it's um, a positive. So the further we get from a metro area, the more entrepreneurs and have, maybe having grown up in a rural area and thinking about entrepreneurship there, I thought, oh, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> but um, thank you for pointing out some of these uh, relationships, potentially the multicollinearity. Uh, we've done a little bit of playing with um, the variables we we include in the specification, we were you know kind of worried about bad controls too that we might have some things, uh, some explanatory variables that are you know explaining broadband, and we can do more of those robustness checks. So I appreciate those ideas um, very much, and uh, look forward to any other questions from the group here. All 
Okay, if there's no more questions, um, we'll move on to conclusion. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Kristen Devlin and Stefan Getz at the Northeast Regional Center for Rural Development for providing the platform for this today. Um, and uh, all the participants who signed up and came. I'd also like to thank our discussants and our presenters. Um, we're gonna try to do this every two weeks or so and uh, you'll be getting information by email and that'll be it. So if there's not any questions, um, we'll conclude. Thank you.